We live at the bottom of an ocean of air, a thick layer of gas and water which protects our planet from the deadly void of outer space. And would you believe it? This ocean is teeming with life. A myriad of species drift in the atmosphere. Insects, seeds, pollen, bacteria. By analogy with sea plankton, these tiny organisms have been given the collective name aeroplankton. Over the last few decades, many scientists have explored this third dimension of our world. Relatively unknown until recently, aerobiology, the study of life in our planet's atmosphere, tracks the movements of these airborne life forms in clouds, raindrops, and sandstorms. Biodiversity, health, climate, a series of discoveries has been made about how these tiny organisms influence not only our lives, but our living world as a whole. Overhead, a precious and invisible ecology offering a new frontier of exploration. You feel far away from everything here. That's what's interesting. We're trying to get some height to rise above the Earth's surface to see if it's colonized by life, in what way and by which life forms. It's circulating. There's a little bit of air. The wind speed is maybe 20 kilometers per hour, so in one hour a particle will travel 20 kilometers, which is a considerable distance. Pierre Amato studies life forms in the Earth's atmosphere at the Institute of Chemistry at Clermont-Ferrand in central France. We catch up with him 1,500 meters above sea level, on top of the Puy de Dôme Observatory. He's setting up plankton traps, air aspirators that filter and capture tiny airborne organisms. For Pierre Amato, the sky around us is far from empty. He offers us an astonishing description of the ocean of air in which we live. Everything in the atmosphere comes from the ground, from Earth's surface. Well, almost everything. So you have a kind of reflection in the air of what's happening on the ground. All of this is in a state of flux. It's very dynamic. Everything moves and combines. Day after day, winds brush and scrape every surface on Earth and whip up all sorts of living and non-living particles into the atmosphere. They're invisible, but constantly around us. These particles can reach heights of 5,000 meters and form reflections in the sky of the different environments on the ground. Plumes of dead leaf matter, pollen, molds, and bacteria rise into the air above forests. When the wind blows, it distorts. It creates a kind of plume of the forest imprint, which spreads across the landscape. Grass debris, small insects, fragments of sheep hair rise into the air above a meadow. The highway in the distance creates a world of tire dust, droplets of grease, and fine particles. High altitude winds mix and transport these different emanations. Constantly moving air carries this multitude of life forms, this aerial plankton, through the sky on its currents. At the National Research Institute for Agriculture, Food and Environment in Rennes, Western France, 
Christelle Bouchard and Manuel Plongenet collect the catch from this mysterious looking chimney in the middle of the countryside. It is a huge pooter, or insect aspirator. You can feel the air gushing out of the trap. This trap is 12 meters tall. Well, not exactly 12 meters, because it's a British model. It's 40 feet tall, which is a bit more than 12 meters. The idea is not to catch insects flying at ground level, which are really local movements. What we want to do is capture insects that have been carried high into the air by wind and probably traveled long distances. It will be more representative of what is floating over the whole region. Wednesday's container, it's packed. The flies are very much alive. It's a sign of fine weather. We'll see what's inside back at the lab. Insects are the largest living things that make up aerial plankton. Depending on their size and the wind strength, they spend a few hours or several days in the air and can reach heights of 1,500 meters. The trap sucks up everything in the vicinity. The agronomists use it to look out for and warn farmers about the arrival of clouds of aphids and other crop ravaging insects. It operates 24 seven. There's quite a crowd here. Probably a sunny day. Yes, more than usual. There's an aphid here. So there's one here and another hiding there. There's one here too. The beet aphid. A whole world stopped in its tracks. Beetles, ants, flies, bugs, and even spiders an incredible variety of species for an invisible aerial ballet. As in the marine environment, you find lots of cells, algae, small crustaceans, and so on. But in a cubic meter of air above our heads, you also find all sorts of organisms, such as spores, pollen, and bacteria, and also lots of little insects and spiders. For living things, winds are rather like magic carpets. The air is an open door, a possibility, an opportunity to feed, to reproduce, or to change their life. are capable of active flight, more often than not, aerial dispersal is a passive process. The creatures carried aloft as aerial plankton do not control the direction, the altitude, or the distance traveled during the journey. The species found in aerial plankton are typically organisms that produce huge numbers of offspring and send these offspring in large quantities in every direction in the hope of finding a place. Some of these offspring will land somewhere and rapidly colonize the environment. Abundance is the name of the game for the living creatures who take to the skies and do not hesitate to throw their offspring to the wind. For plants, the wind is a powerful dispersal force and 90% of all plants use it. Seeds often have shapes that enable them to fly away on the slightest breeze. A single tree entrusts millions of these precious seeds to air currents. Fungi ensure their reproduction by releasing billions and billions of microscopic spores 
and relying on the wind for dispersal. But it's a bit hit and miss. As for insects, scientists estimate thousands of tons pass over our heads each year. All of these living things participate in this gigantic aerial lottery where the chances of survival are slim. Most of these offspring will die during the journey. The benefit is not individual. Very few individuals gain anything. It's those that land in the right place. But those that do land in the right place will have a huge benefit, producing millions of offspring. So in the end, the results are positive. Despite the dangers and the high mortality rate, over 80% of airborne travelers die during the journey. Many widespread and thriving species on our planet actively embark on air currents. And what happens to those that don't succeed? They die in the air of cold land in the wrong place, or get eaten. Aerial plankton constitutes a rich food source for the predators who intercept the tiny life forms on their journey. And their corpses provide nutrients that end up in the water or the soil. When you part the vegetation like this to see what's going on at ground level, you almost immediately see these tiny spiders scurrying about. These spiders don't spin webs. Here we have a species commonly found in this sort of habitat, which is called a pardosa. It lives in very unstable habitats. These salt marshes are frequently flooded, and when this happens, the salt marsh has to be recolonized. This tiny spider is going to show us just how vital aerial dispersal is for the living things that rely on it. Julien Petillon and his team from Rennes University in western France are studying the Pardosa probecensis populations living in 12 marshes scattered along the length of the Brittany coast. The scientists catch the creatures found under the thick layer of grasses and algae. After the insect aspirator, here's the spider aspirator. We've never found this spider anywhere else than in these salt marshes, not even in the habitats around the salt marshes. For this reason, we assume it cannot leave the salt marshes by walking or running, so there's no ground dispersal. We know this species doesn't float very well, so we can assume that it's not dispersed by seawater. Therefore, if there is genetic mixing, we can assume that it has occurred through aerial dispersal. Confined to their marshes with no possibility of leaving them, these incredible spiders have taken to the skies in order to reproduce and prevent genetic impoverishment. Julien Petillon's team is trying to determine whether the spiders found in the different salt marshes are related. Yeah. 
Did you get any? I managed to catch one. It's definitely a Pardosa purbeckensis. I don't think it's an adult. What do you think? No, no, it's a subadult. It is a subadult, but it's big enough for us to be able to work on. In other words, crush it, extract its DNA, then sequence small parts of a gene. And by sequencing a part of the gene, we'll be able to compare the populations and estimate the exchange of individuals, the gene flows, and therefore the mixing that may have occurred between these populations. The first results of this study show that the marshes are islands of life connected by prevailing winds. Some appear to be starting points for the spiders, some are checkpoints, while others are the end of the journey for those that land in them. The maximum dispersal distance is 200 kilometers, a vast territory for such tiny creatures to cover. The unpredictable nature of winds and of aerial dispersal have resulted in a sophisticated mechanism without which the Pardosa perbeckensis could simply not survive. Well before the advent of genetic sequencing, wandering spiders had already got themselves noticed because scientists have known about the existence of aerial plankton for almost 200 years. In 1835, on his way to the Galapagos Islands aboard HMS Beagle, Charles Darwin noted spiders landing on the rigging of the ship, even though it was far away from any shore. In the second half of the 19th century, through a series of experiments, Louis Pasteur proved that there are always what he called organized corpuscles suspended in the air. He opened the doors of a world inhabited by microorganisms. Tuberculosis, anthrax, meningitis, bacteria were soon identified and associated with diseases. In the early 20th century, these germs in the air scared people. They threw open their windows and did gymnastics. A new science appeared, aerobiology. The first comparative analyses were soon conducted. In one volume of air, 55,000 bacteria were found in the Rue de Rivoli in Paris, but just 7,600 beneath the trees in a public park. In the Swiss Alps, a hotel advertised itself by displaying a sign outside. Only 25 bacteria, a tourist's dream. In the 1930s, the celebrated pilot Charles Lindbergh flew over the frozen wastes of northern Canada with sticky paper attached to the nose of his airplane. With this, he collected many samples of fungal spores, pollen, and microalgae. The idea that living things can survive long, high-altitude journeys gained ground. But for some strange reason, aerobiological research soon dried up the microorganisms in the air we breathe were forgotten. Until the end of the 20th century. With advances in satellite imaging, an incredible amount of previously hidden microscopic travelers were revealed to scientists for the first time. If you blow the dust off a piece of furniture, the dust will be carried by the air current that you've created. Exactly the same phenomenon occurs in the air. These dust particles have such low masses that once they're suspended in the atmosphere, they tend to stay there and drift on the air current. François Dulac studies the intercontinental transport of desert dust. He tells us about the two billion or so tons of dust that is picked up from the world's largest deserts every year and moves through the atmosphere. The gigantic scale of these dust transports was only revealed by satellites in the 1980s. Immediately afterwards, aerobiologists realized just how far aerial plankton could be displaced thanks to this fantastic mode of transport. 
on a pas seulement de la matière. You not only find mineral matter, but organic matter, possibly living matter. Et donc on a des microorganismes. There are microorganisms, bacteria, viruses, possibly fungi. Et donc lorsque les So when the dust particles become airborne, they carry all of these living microorganisms to places where they do not usually occur. It's so easy for bacteria, fungal spores, or viruses to fly when they hitch a ride on a tiny grain of dust. With the desert wind, grains of sand are thrown up into the air, and when they fall back down, they shatter the finest clays. These tons of dust particles and their tiny hitchhikers are sucked up by columns of warm air and soar three or four kilometers into the air. We can track the long-distance transport of these dust particles. Satellite imagery shows the formation of a plume over the Sahara Desert. With each passing hour, the plume becomes bigger and starts to move. I'm going to go forward in time. Two days later, we can see that this massive cloud of dust is starting to drift towards the Atlantic Ocean. And within days, it will be over Western France. Then, in all likelihood, it will hit the British Isles and possibly Scandinavia. Earth's weather systems, depressions, anticyclones, warm air currents, cold air currents, move, attract, or repel these bands of dust. The bands form highways in the air, which wrap around our planet. Three to four kilometer thick dust plumes take a week to cross the Atlantic. The atmosphere is a life-giving environment. Matter is added, chemical elements are added, and possibly nutrients too. These natural desert dust transports actually contribute to the balance of the ecosystems on the Earth's surface. Aerial plankton contains numerous tiny creatures. They travel very high, very far. But what are their trajectories? And what is their environmental impact? All of these microorganisms eventually fall to the ground somewhere on our planet. Vale. Vale. Emilio Casamayor of the Center for Advanced Studies in Catalonia studies what is known as microbial deposition in relation to climate change. He has conducted the most comprehensive assessment of airborne microorganisms to date. We catch up with him and his team in the Spanish Pyrenees. We're 2,000 meters above sea level here because we're not interested in the effects of local contamination. We're at high altitude to collect microorganisms that move through the upper atmosphere and make intercontinental journeys. There is a week's worth of rain in the collector. Here, we have microorganisms and particles. We're going to collect them in a filter to take them back to the lab. And now... The particles are in here, and this water is clear. 
All of the particles have been retained by our filter. There are organic particles such as bacteria, fungi and pollen, as well as non-organic particles such as clays, silicates and minerals, which come from distant sites. In this case, it could be African dust particles, for instance, that have traveled through the air and then fallen with the rain. And we collect all of this. In this filter, there are thousands of millions of microorganisms. These constant deliveries of microorganisms are a natural process that has occurred throughout the history of planet Earth. When they fall to the ground, the plankton's little travelers would appear to have a profound impact on ecosystems. Some bacteria stimulate the growth of plants by attaching to them and capturing atmospheric nitrogen. Others sink into the soil and recycle dead organic matter. Viruses and microscopic mold regulate animal and plant populations. They're microorganisms which, when they fall, can colonize new environments. It's an excellent dispersal system. The bacteria colonize environments all over the planet. These small reactive biological units fall and start to develop life. By identifying the microorganisms present in rainwater over several years and studying weather data, Emilio Casamayor's team was able to calculate back trajectories and then work out which region, sea, ocean, or continent the flows of plankton came from. And they discovered an astonishing consistency in the arrival of microorganisms. In summer, the aerial plankton is mostly of regional origin. It is swept off agricultural land in Spain, northern Europe, cities, lakes, and rivers. But in winter, the flows of plankton arrive en masse from the Atlantic Ocean. Marine bacteria and viruses cross the ocean in three days and fall on the mountains. When Xavier, Joan, and I analyzed the first results, we saw that there were consistent seasonal trends. It was a eureka moment. It's incredible. How come the same microorganisms appear at the same time every year? We know that this occurs in the sea and in trees. Some plants sprout in spring, others in summer, and these cycles occur in the atmosphere too. The flows of plankton are therefore not random mixes of species floating around in the atmosphere. The microbial masses, which rise into the air and then land, have their own cycles, their own seasons, just like bears, flowers, and bees. But the life-giving atmosphere can also become a threat. Among the hordes of microbes drifting through the air, some could harm us. Can microscopic aerial plankton fall on us and make us sick? Miasma was the word we once used for the bad air that caused disease. In the past, when there were very few methods of prevention and no knowledge of transmission mechanisms, people believed the environment, the air, was responsible for the plagues that struck them. This old intuition that atmospheric air was a carrier of disease was accurate. We now know that microbes and viruses circulate in the air and can infect people, animals and plants. Avian flu, or foot and mouth disease, can be spread by the wind over several kilometers from farm to farm. Air conditioning units can accidentally release Legionella bacteria and spread a respiratory disease that can result in death, Legionnaires. The unbelievable quantities of spores released into the air by fungi, then deposited in the soil, are so many microscopic time bombs waiting to go off. 
Fungi can be pretty formidable pathogens. Hospitals know this all too well because when work is done near hospitals, earth is stirred up, sand is stirred up, and if unfavorable winds pick up this stirred up earth full of spores of aspergillus or of other types of fungus or mold pathogenic to humans, this can result in epidemics in hospitals. Aspergillus is a type of fungus that is found absolutely everywhere and is in the atmosphere. When there are large quantities and a person is immunocompromised, then they risk catching this type of disease. This medium-range dispersal of agents pathogenic to humans has been proved. Short-range contamination from zero to a few meters by contaminated droplets, as is the case with flu and the coronavirus responsible for COVID-19, has also been confirmed. But no solid evidence of long-distance transmission from 100 to several hundred kilometers has yet been found. Very few human pathogens can travel great distances. In the laboratory, we looked for the coronavirus's weaknesses and discovered that it is very fragile indeed. The coronavirus aerosolized outside because of ultraviolet rays, because of desiccation, that is, the dryness of the air, will die very quickly. It will disintegrate. The atmosphere is even deadlier for microorganisms than it is for the insects dispersed in it. One in a million survive the aerial journey. Just because we find a large number of bacteria of apparently worrying pathogens doesn't mean we should be worried. In the vast majority of cases, they will be dead. There will be traces of viral, bacterial, parasitic genomes, but they will not be active viruses. But even if they were, the fact is, it is extremely rare for us to fall ill with a virus or a bacterium. In order to become infected, you need a significant viral load, because fortunately, the body possesses many defenses. Our immune defense system acts as a guard. However, most infectious diseases today are spread via another air route. Airline passengers spread microbes around the globe. In spring, pollen grains join this big roundabout in the air. Pollen contains a tree's sperm. Pollen grains fly through the air, often very high, very far, towards the female organs of another tree. This role of the atmosphere is very beneficial for the living world. But pollen grains can break on their journey. They then release the irritating substances that make pollen allergies a major issue for public health. At the University of Lille in northern France, Nicolas Vizet and Marie Choel are studying captured airborne pollen grains. They hope to find out whether pollen grains break more easily if they have encountered atmospheric pollutants in the sky. Let's put it into focus first. There they are. This pollen is completely torn apart. This is a sample collected in the environment, a sample that was collected during the birch pollen season. The pollen grains are cracked. We can see that they have suffered to such an extent that their contents have spilled out. The protective membrane has been literally ripped apart.
The shattered pollen we can see here has lost its reproductive function, its primary function. And these small particles that have been released are dangerous for asthma sufferers. But this image is not representative of all the pollen grains in the atmosphere, obviously. What we're trying to do here is count these grains. What percentage of these are damaged? Is it significant for health? To understand what happens between a pollen grain and a pollutant in the atmosphere, the researchers are trying to reproduce this encounter in the lab. This pollen is deliberately contaminated. We make our pollen grains suffer in the lab. It's the revenge of allergy sufferers. There's ozone flowing through here, and I'm going to drop the pollen into the ozone. A reaction is going to occur between the ozone molecules and the surface of the pollen grain. And that's what interests me in this experiment. We sometimes speak of good ozone and bad ozone. The ozone found in the upper atmosphere protects us from some ultraviolet rays, so it's beneficial. But the ozone located at sea level where we live is harmful to human health. It's an atmospheric pollutant. I'm going to expose my pollen to a fairly high dose of ozone, typical of the pollution peaks we get in summer in polluted conditions. The contaminated pollen is subjected to different tests. A pollen grain cannot get inside our lungs. It's too big and is stopped by the cilia in the nose. But if it breaks, it releases particles, carriers of allergenic proteins that can get into the bronchial tubes and cause allergies and asthma. The aim of these experiments is to subject the pollen to the kind of ordeals it encounters on its journey through the air. For instance, traveling through rain. More often than not, this causes pollen grains to explode. Will the pollen contaminated in the laboratory break more easily in water than healthy pollen grains? Marie Choel is calculating the proportion of damaged pollen grains. After the water test comes the mechanical shock test. On its journey, especially in urban air, pollen picked up by wind can be dashed against buildings or car windscreens. What happens then? Nicolas Vizet flings healthy and contaminated pollen against a surface in an impactor and counts the number of grains that have burst. This shows that air pollution weakens pollen grains, making them more likely to rupture. And so, these days, pollen grains are more likely to cause asthma attacks and more likely to break in the atmosphere. It's an image on a very tiny scale of our footprint. I think that human activity has changed everything, polluted everything, even on the tiniest of scales. Pollen covered in particles emitted by human activity. Soot particles from road traffic, iron oxide particles, zinc particles, manganese particles from industry. Just as scientists are beginning to understand the importance of aerial plankton for the Earth machine and its inhabitants, the sky is being radically altered by humans. We burn a lot of fossil fuels for transport, for heating, for industry. From space today, we can see fires on the surface of the Earth, forest fires, agricultural fires, and the fact is, there are fires constantly, depending on the season. But there is also a growing phenomenon, namely huge wildfires, as a result of climate change. And all of this combustion ends up in the atmosphere as gases or particles. Our sky is not the healthiest of places. Coal, petrol, wood, we humans are burning the planet. Housing and human activity create new environments all over the surface of the Earth. The emissions from these new terrestrial environments release an incredible amount of particles into the air, as well as gases such as carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrogen oxides. 
the composition of the atmosphere is changing significantly. The creatures found in aerial plankton have to navigate this new man-made sky. And the direction of global air currents is being affected too. In the system of the atmosphere, in the atmospheric system, there are corridors or highways determined by the position of storms, anticyclones, which themselves determine the direction in which air currents will move. We now know that this general pattern can change due to the alterations caused by climate change. And the direction of the winds, the trends, the patterns, which have been stable for hundreds, thousands of years, could change. This can have an impact on ecosystems everywhere and on the distribution of organisms. Advances have been made in aerobiology and new fields of research are opening up. Scientists long thought that microorganisms could not have any activity as they drifted through the atmosphere and that they went into pause mode until they fell to the ground. And yet, it would appear that some of them managed to remain active. What can they possibly do in such a harsh environment? We catch up again with Pierre Amato in the clouds on top of the Puy de Dôme. The weather is clearly cloudy today, so it's quite good for collecting cloud samples. It isn't freezing yet, but almost, as you can probably feel. A lovely big cloud like this is ideal for taking lots of samples. We're just finishing setting up the droplet impactor. It's a sort of cloud aspirator with which we can collect the particles, that is, the small cloud droplets suspended in the air. We're going to force them to impact, to crash into a surface. They're going to drip and we'll be able to collect them in a bottle that we'll place under here. Clouds are suspended water systems. Water covers over 70% of the Earth's surface. They could be atmospheric oases for airborne creatures by providing water, or food when the water droplets contain plant debris. The airborne creatures could also fall to the ground with the rain. I'm putting myself in a bacterium's shoes. What is it like to live in an environment like this, to live in a cloud? We have a huge amount of droplets here, and in about one in 10,000, there is a bacterium. We can imagine all these bacteria isolated from one another. Do they interact? If so, how? How do they feel to be all alone? Are they really all alone or grouped together in the same droplet when the desert around us is much bigger than we think? So I want to know how life can sustain itself in there because there is actually life that sustains itself. The proportion of living bacteria in a cloud is huge, about 50%. We know that they spend three to 10 days hanging in the air. That gives them time to do things. Like all living things, bacteria constantly make different proteins to attach to dust particles, to protect themselves from ultraviolet rays, or to produce digestive enzymes. Cloud water analysis enables the researchers to find these molecules and reveal these tiny traces of life. Bacteria do things in clouds. They carry on living. That's to say, they take in nutrients, carbon for instance, nitrogen nutrients, excrete carbon dioxide, and release molecules, such as sugars, in order to better adhere to a surface. So there are all sorts of possible interactions, some of which we've revealed, between the bacterium, or the microorganism, and its environment. A water droplet. In Pierre Amato's petri dishes, the incredible variety of bacteria and fungi are evidence of the microbial life in the clouds. But life in the air is challenging. Today, scientists who have wondered about this believe that the atmosphere cannot be a habitat in the traditional sense of the term.
planet Earth's small inhabitants simply pass through our ocean of air. A few years ago, an incredible scientific discovery rocked the world of aerobiology. A bacterium well known to scientists and found in abundance in nature and in clouds could actually make it rain. The concept of bioprecipitation, rain caused by living things, was invented. It revolutionized thinking in aerobiology, meteorology, and agronomics. At the National Research Institute for Agriculture, Food and Environment in Montfavet in the south of France, Cindy Morris's work focuses on this bacterium with strange powers. Its name is Pseudomonas syringae. Pseudomonas syringae is known as a bacterium that can live on the surface of plants and cause disease. I have done a little experiment to show you what the bacterium Pseudomonas syringae can do to plants. Cindy Morris sprayed a solution containing the bacterium on the outer leaves of this wild lettuce. But she protected the inner leaves. Then put the plant into a freezer at minus six degrees Celsius for a few minutes. And this is the result. We can see that the tissue where the bacterium was present have frozen, then dried. But the tissue where the bacterium was not present have not frozen. Pseudomonas syringae burns plants by freezing them. It possesses a gene which produces a protein that creates ice crystals. These crystals enable it to pierce the plant cell wall and feed on the flesh. These bacteria are called ice nucleators. It is thought that they are capable of accelerating or boosting in clouds the formation of ice crystals that melt into rain as they fall. It seems to work in a test tube. Everyone knows if you invite friends over for a drink and there's no ice, it's too late. It takes time. To make ice quickly, you need something to kickstart the process. In this tube, I have a suspension of the ice nucleating bacterium Pseudomonas syringae. I'll show you what happens if I add a bit of the bacterium to the distilled water in this sterile tube. As you can see, it's frozen. Can this instant miracle of water into ice occur outside in the wider world? Are ice nucleating bacteria able to take off from plants, ascend into a cloud, and trigger their gene to form raindrops by freezing water? Bioprecipitation is a hot topic. Scientists are learning more and more about how the Earth and the atmosphere are linked by this rain cycle and microorganisms like Pseudomonas syringae. On a we have measurements that suggest it can cause frequent rain cycles. That the rain falling today, thanks to the interaction between the atmosphere, plants, and other microorganisms, will have an effect on the rain that comes later. 
qui arrive plus tard. So it isn't about the amount of rain that falls, but the frequency of these events. Rain that falls more often thanks to plants capable of providing the sky with the right bacteria. Cindy Morris is part of an international community of scientists who want to invent a new form of agriculture, where plant varieties favorable to the growth of ice nucleating bacteria would be grown on particular plots. These special creatures, this aerial plankton, could then be used to combat drought in some agricultural areas. A great project for the future. The world can change if we look up at the sky and take air dwellers into account. Aerial plankton has shaped the world in which we live, and it continues to influence our lives day after day. Scientists still have many questions about its role in the great Earth machine. But it's time we understood that there is a rich and fragile world of life above our heads, which we must protect, just as we do our forests, deserts, and oceans. <laughs>